We have a meetup every single month here at the Mixed Space, and we choose the topic based on what's happening in the world, based on the season that we're in, based on um, cultural moments. And we chose to make this meetup a little fun and focus on Halloween costumes and the concept of dressing up. We looked at Uh, We did a lot of research around the difference between regalia versus costuming versus fashion versus dressing um, versus spiritual clothing. Like what's the evolution of all of that? And where is this coming from? Like this, the end, the end idea is right. Like a year after year after year, we see these like tragic appropriation mishaps oftentimes by celebrities who are then apologizing because they apparently had no idea that it would be hurtful or didn't think it applied to them or like whatever the question is. But I think that concept is also compounding. Like later we'll get into like what it looks like to appropriate the appropriation of an appropriation when you're the copy of a copy of a copy, like it just like, where does it start and where does it end? Um, But the mixed space is a place for us to come together on a monthly basis to share stories to educate ourselves and each other, to process the learning that is happening in the world as we continue to unlearn the dominant structures that no longer serve us and we build a new world together. Like my question when I founded the mixed space was like, what does that look like, right? Like we have ideas and literature and academia around dismantling oppressive structures, but like, what does it look like to maintain a new world together? And that's something that needs to be practiced consistently. And there's no person that has the answer. It's like literally all of us being together, figuring it out. And that's what we're doing today. Um, So we're looking at um, clothing and tradition and history and costume and globalized trading of materials, which made, you know, certain outfits more accessible. Um, We are a mix today of amazing people from around the world. Like our audience is, is global. Thank goodness. We have a really amazing community of folks who speak all sorts of languages who um, use all sorts of gender identities and identify in in multiple ways. And that is really what it's about. Like it's actually about creating space for everyone to be their full self and then figuring out how we move together in our truth. So that is about the mixed space. And um, I'm actually gonna make it a little bit personal today and share, I actually can't believe that I have this, but um, still, because it's quite a long time, but I'm going to share my own like personal story. So when I moved to New York City in 2014 for college, I had, I moved from Germany. I was raised in Germany. Um, My mom is German and my dad is African-American. I am, I speak two languages. I speak English and German and some French. Um, hence the mixed space, like someone who lives on multiple continents and speaking multiple languages and spans multiple, you know, narratives inside of my body. I'm constantly asking myself, you know, who am I and where do I belong and, um, where do I fit in and how can I help and how can I, um, continue to show up for community? Um, because that is what has made me who I am. So anyway, I moved from Germany and had it had a lot of access to like, Um, the conversation of race in America. I didn't really know a lot about it because it hadn't been a big topic in my home. Also, having lived in Germany, it wasn't a big topic around the US. If anything, it was German. So I saw this and I bought it and I didn't really think much about it. And I'll like lean into the camera because I want to show you kind of the detailing of the scene. And when I walked in, I actually, this was, you know, one of those perfect learning moments where I was interning at Ping Chong and Company, which is um, a theater company. And the founder, Ping Chong, is a genius and he's Chinese. And so I walk in and he is like a real, like a wonderfully diverse group of collaborators that they work with. And, um, you know, I walk up and, and the girl looks at me and I look at her and I'm like, oh, And she's like, yeah, what are you wearing? And I'm like, oh, this is, I'm actually, this is cultural appropriation. And it kind of hit me in that moment. Like when I I could tell that the vibe changed and she was like, where did you get that from? And I was like, I just bought it for $275 at um, Free People. And she was like, wow, like I'm Chinese and I find this offensive. Like, I don't think it's okay for you to be wearing this quite honestly, because you don't even know where it comes from. And you bought it at a store 
that's making all this money from fashionable items that's really appropriating a culture that you don't know anything about and that they're not benefiting, they're not supporting with, with their money. And I was like, you, I completely understand. And that was like a big moment for me personally, because I had come from this place of like, oh, this is cute. And I find this pretty and I like the colors and I, you know, I love the detail of it, but I didn't understand what actual kind of what the history of it is and what goes into making like the authentic version of whatever this, and I'm pretty sure they called it a kimono, which it's not, it's a jacket. It's literally, it's just a jacket. There's nothing. It doesn't even really fit me that well. It's not very well made. Like it's not a kimono. It's really not. And, and so even that, like, why are we calling things a kimono that are definitely not a kimono? Because we don't really question it. And we just like, it's a general term that we think we understand. Like, it's like, we all agree on something that has some kind of a shape that could be a kimono. So we'll, you call it that, but um, there's obviously so much more to it. So I just wanted to start off the meetup by sharing that because it's also like, you know, all of us are together in the space. No one's perfect. And all of us have a journey of learning. Some of you started earlier. Some of you are just joining today and you might be silent listeners because you really just have questions. Um, and the space is, is benevolent. Like this is a benevolent space, which doesn't mean that, you know, you can say whatever you want or people don't, are not going to hold you accountable, but we're the opposite of cancel culture because the, the idea is to be able to integrate your learning and then pay it forward and help other people learn and, and create more equity. Um, so that's my little spiel of, uh, the topic that we're getting into. And I really hope that it helps people kind of like loosen up around their own experiences, like maybe mistakes that folks have made or like experiences that they've had with their friend groups or questions that you have, because this is a space for us to vocalize it and get it out. And then also we can show up stronger and more confident and more educated in our conversations with, with our friends and our families and our colleagues, et cetera. Ariel. Thank you for that story, Lily. And as you were talking about that, I was like thinking about this, which I wore because I got it from a thrift store, but I don't know. It, it's also might not be okay. So let's just take it off. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that story. This brings us to kind of the vibe of today. We're going to go through a PowerPoint that both Lily and I have curated. However, feel free to interject if we mispronounce something, for example, or if you have more information that you'd like to add. This is a space where we are going to all kind of go through the history of Halloween, cultural appropriation, look at current events, examples of like really bad stuff, and also be asking y'all questions like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I can speak for myself when saying through this research, I've actually kind of started to get questions of like, what's okay, what's not okay? How do we, how do we bring this to children? How does this relate to younger children's like, um, Halloween costumes. So feel free literally to take yourself off mute as, as we said earlier, like this is, we're all in a virtual living room together and we're talking about cultural appropriation because we have all experienced it in our daily lives. I can guarantee you to some extent. So let's talk about, let's talk about it. Let's unpack it. And like, let's just go through it. So without further ado, sacred seams, the meetup, here we go. Let's just, <laughs> let's just be a family. We're just gonna like, let's just get into it. Okay. So obviously we are calling the meetup sacred seams because we wanted to shine a light on the practice, the tradition, and the stories around some of the seams that are sewn for special occasions and for ceremony. So we're hoping that this moment inspires you to dig into the seams that you hold sanctity, that hold sanctity in your identity. And that if you are celebrating Halloween, that you find a costume that is uniquely you and that tells your story and that this is the meetup that ends cultural appropriation now and forever. And um, that's what we're doing here today. Thank you for that. So, okay, so let's start from the beginning. Okay, so Halloween's origins date back to the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain. Um, so the Celts lived 2000 years ago, mostly in the area that's Ireland now and the United Kingdom and Northern France. And for them, they celebrated New Year on November 1st. So this day marked the end of summer and the harvest and the beginning of the dark cold winter and time of year that often was associated with human death. 
So the Celts believe that on the night before the new year, uh, the boundary between the worlds of the living and the dead became blurred. So on the night of October 31st, they celebrated uh, Sowin when it was believed that the ghosts of the dead returned to earth and it gave them a chance to communicate with ancestors and help restless spirits return back to their world. Okay, so let's check out the next slide. So let's get into the history of dressing up for Halloween. Yeah, which that really comes from the idea of like warding off evil spirits and reconciling with death, which is why folks wore skulls and dressed up as ghosts, um, which is why now still we have the morbid and the frightening aspects of Halloween. Exactly. And Halloween kind of was always seen as a day to act outside of societal norms, which I think can still be felt today. Like we're trying to dress up and do stuff that's like a a little different. So... Yeah, I mean, the anonymity was historically a huge part of Halloween, folks being unrecognizable, wearing masks and disguises. So let's hit the next slide. So this is kind of a big reason why folks found solace in Halloween who hold a queer identity, right? So we want to talk about also the influence of gay community and how cross-dressing became such a big part of Halloween culture. So in 1907, uh, the Pittsburgh paper reported that the mas- that girls were masquerading as tomboys on Halloween. And in 1912, women and men were actually arrested in Pittsburgh for cross-dressing. So if you can picture like LGBTQIA plus community members were arrested for being caught in public wearing three or more items of clothing of the opposite gender. But within two years, cross-dressing became so popular and prevalent that the Pittsburgh police actually declared that they would no longer stop folks from cross-dressing during the Halloween holiday. So this opened a door for more freedom. And we see the Halloween parade um, of 1974, which began when Ralph Lee, who was a puppeteer, set forth his expertise that soon blossomed into the first official gay pride parade of the nation. It welcomed gays, straights, drag queens, lesbian, men, women, kids, teenagers, and people from all walks of life to support the movement. In five years, the parade crowd went from 160 people to 250,000 people. So now Halloween has has gone a long way since it's pagan cultures and ghost stories. And now it's kind of symbolizing a day of liberation and play for queer people of all varieties. So on the next slide, This is a video that I wanted to include because it was important to me to show modern representation of folks of color. Um, This is the YouTube channel from Femme Fashion Spirit. Um, Their channel really inspired me because they were really just sharing moments of which they felt beautiful and they felt like they wanted to share themselves in their own space and with their own power. And many queer kids and, and, and trans kids like are growing up essentially wearing a mask. And so for a lot of folks, it's like almost Halloween every day, which also reminds me of National Coming Out Day, which was yesterday. So National Happy National Coming Out Day again. Um, And this holiday is one holiday that kind of praises like the frights and the fetishes that we are told to cover up. So the question kind of becomes, is Halloween basically a national LGBTQIA plus holiday? (laughs) And this is kind of a moment, like, what do y'all think? Like, what do y'all think is this from y'all experience Is Halloween like a national holiday? Like, do you engage in the queer culture and balls and any of that? Like, I'd love, I'd love to hear it. Depends on how you do it. She, okay, Bean, I see that. Would cross-dressing be seen as appropriation today? That is really interesting. What would they be appropriating? I don't, I don't, that would be interesting. Like what would, like across appropriating the original movement is that really, yeah, is that the question? Also, Philip, I kind of see you, if you want to say something, if you have any input, like, please share. Appropriating gay culture, yeah, question. People that wouldn't cross-dress any other day. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. Right, so then you have like folks- Like queer baiting? Just... What'd you say? Like, is it like queer baiting? Queer baiting, that's a new vocab word, putting that in the chat. Intention is everything. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Well, I mean, I'll share that um, 
there was a lot of explosive culture that came out of this kind of freedom around Halloween. So it's like with a crowd of 250,000. Yes, Philip, I see your hand raised. Please go. Yeah. Hi. As uh, someone who comes from the alphabet soup community of LGBTQIA+, um, I've always found that Halloween is really uh, a time for um, really creative expression. Um, even if you are um, you know, in a heteronormative relationship or you identify as, uh, as straight or as an ally to, um, you know, to the queer communities, I've, uh, it seems to be kind of like a, a night of permission where mm-hmm. there is an understanding that you can be whomever you want to be, whatever you want to be, and not be persecuted for that or be shamed into that. And so, you know, whether you might have a, a body type that might not necessarily, you know, uh, be a centerfold, you know, style of, of, of body type, um, you know, that you might have thought of back in like, you know, Sports Illustrated back in the 90s, but now you can be all kinds of body types and all kinds of ethnicities and be able to express yourself, whatever, you know, I'm getting old, Madonna, express yourself. Like, um, you know, it, it, it's almost like a permission to, to celebrate their individuality and, um, and come out of the broom closet for that one night. Um, and, you know, for, in relationship to the drag aspect of it, you know, it would seem like, you know, a lot of performers or those who are, um, who dress in drag, or I don't want to even say, because drag, I think it can be a loaded term because there, there are people who, you know, dress as um, their non-cis gender identity um, for survival, for identity and for um, acceptance, and maybe sometimes even to disappear. So I think there's, as a holiday, as an official holiday, I mean, I've heard Halloween referred to as gay Christmas um, because it's like, you know, everyone come out, have fun. But I think to, um, I don't know, as a national holiday, I think it's like a, it can be more of a, it depends on the community that you live in, if that's even acceptable. There are a lot of, especially in the U.S., some um, Bible Belt areas where Halloween isn't recognized. Um, Instead, it's a fall festival. Um, so I think it depends on your community and how accepting they are and how, um, how conservative it can be. Definitely. Definitely. Anyone else want to share anything? Hi, Christian. (laughs) Um, you're on mute. So if you want to share, you're welcome to just take yourself off mute. Okay. Or type. (laughs) Hi, Jerry. Just inviting you also, you're inviting your voice. Um, Bean says, the question makes me think of cross-dress day way back in high school. Many people would laugh at guys in dresses and makeup. And I, I see that as offensive, but it was also a chance for some trans student who weren't out to express themselves for the first time. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even think of that. I had a cross-dress day at school. I went to an all girls school. So there was, there was, there was no cross-dressing. I mean, we could have all dressed as boys, but there would have been no boys dressing as girls. So I think of the HBO show. We're here where three drag queens make over all forms of people. Mm. That's true too. Yeah. That's really interesting. I didn't even catch that. I had cross-dress day at school. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) Are we ready for the next? Yeah, perfect. We're ready for the next slide. Let's do it. Okay. So the majority culture forgets what the minority culture has produced. So this is in reference to the gay community's influence over popularizing adults dressing up for Halloween. Um, And we pulled this from an article and the link to that full article is going to be popped into the chat right now. So we're doing that. Because we like to share all of the resources that we've pulled things from because they're not yeah, just Also, just quote. so you know, we write a blog after our meetups that kind of summarize the meetup and all the links that other people share are also in there. So that's a way like y'all are on our mailing list now that you've RSVP'd. Um, and for those of you who joined off of Instagram, like just off the Zoom link, um, make sure that like you join our mailing list and then you'll get the email with everyone else's um, 
resources because folks drop the most amazing resources in the chat at our meetups. It's like a whole they party. They really do. <laughs> and if you have any resources, feel free to drop it in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. So we decided to take a couple of archetypes like we watched in the video for those of you who are like here from the very beginning. Um, there are a couple of like archetypes that were shown that are just traditionally disgraced, honestly. And so that's like where we're talking about the origin and then we'll talk about the influence and then we'll talk about how that got appropriated. And then it just kind of ends in utter disgrace, essentially. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping also that hearing this knowledge and being able to hear the origins of places can give y'all here agency to kind of call out any cultural appropriation you might see come Halloween. So we're hoping that these facts actually give you some agency. So let's get into it here. So we're going to start talking about um, the kimono. So the kimono, the Japanese kimono has been a traditional garment worn by many for centuries and still holds remarkable symbolic and historical significance in the 21st century today. Yeah. And what I think is really like kind of a fun fact, actually, is that Chinese culture frequently influenced Japanese fashion. So the kimono really originated in China, but it evolved over time and it continues to over, over evolve. And what's important to note is that each detail of the kimono carries some significance to the person wearing it, right? So this will be a common thread in many sacred themes that we discuss today. But regarding the kimono in particular, the layers of the kimono as seen in the photo on the left, for example, represent honor and the history of Japan, of Japan. The, even the length of the sleeves and the thickness of the, the obi belt are significant in ways that they communicate marital status and even levels of maturity. Yeah. And kimonos aren't restricted to one gender. That's why we added the other picture too, because um, it's important to remember that we have, that there's kimonos that, that men wear. Um, I'm not personally privy. Maybe some of you have knowledge on this, like what kind of contemporary Japanese perspective is on like um, gender queer folks or folks who are not don't use binary pronouns and what it looks like for them to be wearing traditional um, clothing for what it looks like for someone who identifies as trans or someone who, again, like doesn't use binary pronouns to be wearing kimono and what their experience has been. So folks um, are um, exposed to this culture and want to share. I would love to learn more about that. My Katrina. Yep. Calavera makeup. Yep. Hawaiian date. Wow, Bean, your school really was going all out with all the days. They were really. Well, it's so hard. crazy to think about because I also totally had that day. Mm -hmm. Like school we didn't day. think anything of it. And I think this is going to tie into like a conversation that we have later about how to address this within kids. So I'm loving that we're having this conversation now because this, you know, just goes into, okay, how do we address this now with kids? This is in our school system. Like we got to rewrite some of the things that we taught children was okay to do. Mm. Um, also want to just highlight Jerry real quick before we move on, Ariel, like, mm -hmm. yes, to seeing Halloween costumes that are actually good. Like what are the Halloween costumes that people celebrate? Like what are inspired ideas that you've seen? I definitely love that content, um, that question. I have um, some of my own examples that we'll get into in a, in a bit, but put them in the chat y'all. Yeah. Examples of like what, uh, what costumes you think would be okay. So I also just want to highlight this quote that we skipped over that was on the other side, which was, you cannot simply put on a kimono. There are many layers and aspects to a kimono. So just really honing in on the importance of even the material that went into to creating such important garments of clothing. Okay. Um, and I can also are... talk about this. Okay. Oh, but we have a hand. <laughs> yeah hi so a little bit of background on myself i work in the entertainment industry uh specifically in uh, cosplay costume play and comic cons i just got back from new york comic con and heading to fan expo canada in a week and one of the things that i've noticed in pop culture is um kind of what i'm calling cultural um approximation mm -hmm. which is um it's close enough where, you know, there really isn't a distinction or like the perceived distinction of the silhouette between a kimono and a chongsam and a hanbok 
it's all the same. It's like this generic Orientalism as quoted, you know, uh, on this particular slide. And I see this observingly from, you know, this adaptation of um, Eastern anime from uh, Asia. So anime, manga culture, and how that becomes translated to American cosplay specifically, where if it kind of looks close enough, it's acceptable. Uh, and uh, there's kind of this dichotomy between, well, everyone can cosplay. It doesn't have to be perfect. And at the same time, it's also like, well, there's, there's like a disregard for the historical cultural uh, significance of why those silhouettes and particular fabrics and particular designs were chosen for that costume designed for that character. So it's something that I do observe and I, I kind of coin it approximation because it just becomes a generic Asian looking gown or, you know, or dress. And the one I, the one I created behind me is, um, is a dress uh, that's worn in the Philippines as silhouette. They're called tear no sleeves. And what all the people don't know is that the Philippine islands, uh, my background is uh, I'm uh, Philippine and Polynesian descent, uh, specifically from Tonga, but the Philippine islands were actually called as Islas Filipinas. It was colonized by Spain. And so a lot of Spanish influence in terms of the Maria Clara dresses and uh, type of um, gown to silhouettes were inherited um, by the Philippines, but the they wouldn't mistake you know, this particular gown with a kimono or changsam or a hanbok. And so I think it's important that, you know, um, people do pay attention to the choices that they make, especially in costume play, cosplay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it just really like, it deepens our experience in the world to pay attention to those details. It's like when you are paying attention to other cultures, details and their history, it teaches you about yourself and your own culture. Like it op opens you up to asking questions. So it's, it's really not even just for the others. It's like for yourself as well. Okay. So now we're getting into like history, Japan, occupying Korea, salsa yeah, shark, another, you know about another, that, yeah. like keep it going. There's no too much. So if you have a lot to say about that, keep it going. Aditi. Hi, um, I wanted to share something that's similar to what Philip said, not so much with um, cosplay, but in popular culture or, or popular media, I should say, um, up until a few years ago, with the South Asian stereotypes, uh, with you know a misplaced turban or a bindi, um, which is that colorful dot on a woman's forehead and and it was sort of done in a way that wasn't accurate um either in the case of the turban or the bindi and it was supposed to it was close enough and that was the the stereotypical image that was being used to convey that character's culture and so i um i can relate to uh what what philip shared i i just wanted to throw that in in there Okay, awesome, awesome. Are we ready for the next slide? I think so, I think we're on this and I did just wanna say, so right now what we're seeing is actually a painter that became obsessed with painting portraits of white women lounging in kimonos. So that's these pictures right here that we're seeing. So this is kind of just an example of a culture asserting dominance over another culture, right? So the reason why they're wearing this is because trade regulations changed in 1853 and Western and European cultures started appropriating kimonos as pajamas and loungewear. And here we have the beginnings of like the significance changing because we talked about the origin of how important this, this wardrobe is. And now we're seeing it even being portrayed in these paintings as loungewear and pajamas, which is, which is totally missing the mark here of the cultural significance and importance of your traditional kimono. So now we can go on to the next slide. So, oh, right. There are people who are truly offended by cultural appropriation and their feelings are completely valid. Um, based on the CNN article, the author goes on to continue. She says, but in Japanese culture, it just doesn't work the same way. The Japanese are really trying to share Japanese culture. So it's very different 
than folks who feel like they've had something that's been stolen from them um, and the defensive way in my, the way that they might react when other people are wearing their culture. So again, like if there's people who here who identify as Japanese, um, I would love to hear if this is resonating with you, if you feel like um, it's landing um, on either side. Like if you, maybe you feel offended and you wanna share your culture, there's obviously like, space for any experience, but um, this um, this article, we're sharing the article in the chat too, so you can get where the quote's from, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm just, Ariel, go, next slide. <laughs> okay, Wait, I was can trying I to, just, oh, yeah, sorry. No. I just oh. wanted to, hey, y'all, yeah, my name's oh, Brittany. Brittany. She's like, can I just interrupt you? Yes, yeah, you no, can. So we, we've been talking, that's great, but we never really, uh, stop to define cultural appropriation, I don't think, and maybe we get into it, so no pressure. But um, I'm really thinking about the place of power yep. in cultural appropriation that isn't just about cultural exchange power and knowledge in particular. I'm not going to get into Foucault, but um, thinking about how people, um, where people are disempowered and people who whose culture, um, people who are part of these communities and cultural groups and ethnic groups who are disempowered from being able to educate people who are being able, who are being framed, who are not a part at all in the process, the experience. Someone in the chat mentioned the importance of like going to professionals, people who actually do this work, who has honed this craft, not from a place of appropriation, but people who are in community. Um, I think power is really important to bring into it and, and intention matters. Um, but knowledge is a critical part of that and pursuing knowledge as well. Um, and I think sometimes it becomes framed as like a permission thing. Well, did mm -hmm. someone say it's okay? And if some people like, oh, if Japanese folks want to share their culture, it's fine. And it's like, it's really thinking about power, your relationship and proximity to the community. Um, and also the knowledge you have about the thing that you claim to be engaging in, especially if your engagement is intending to honor and respect it, celebrate it in some way. Um, and I think it's important to nuance what cultural appropriation or even, um, as Philip said, approximation, um, what that is and where the violence of that work takes place. It's not about feelings, but about actual harm that is perpetuated within these larger systems of inequality where people are perpetually misrepresented in dominant culture, in media, and things like that, where your your opportunity to be celebrated for misrepresenting their culture matters differently than how their culture would have actually been received. So I think it's important to bring all of that to the table, and I'm just dropping that out there um, because it, it's complicated, and that doesn't mean there's no... Um, place for us to land, but it means that we've constantly got to be nuancing all the different layers and dimensions throughout. Amen. Yes. Self Thank you for sharing that. Well said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that link, Sean. Um, the only thing I want to say, Brittany, is um, I hear all of that. If you or anyone else has their own definition of cultural appropriation, we'd love to collect those. And then we can also like go through different perspectives like you're saying um and then we can we can see if we land in a place like we have a moment at the end of the meetup where we do whiteboard and where we really kind of start to dissect like what are we taking out of the space what are the intentions that we're setting like what are we really what's tactile here because it's it doesn't it's not just all like a fluffy conversation it kind of needs to then come out of this space into our bodies, into our lives and really understand like what it is that we're really talking about and dealing with. So I appreciate that. Um, and so we're moving on actually, and exactly to that question of like, well, Ariel, please take it away. Well, I think we actually had another person want to share, right? Kobe. Yes. Kobe oh, yeah. wanted to share. Yeah. Are you guys, are you guys able to hear me? Yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure. I just wanted to comment a little bit about the, the quote on the previous slide, just because, uh, also I think Salsa Shark mentioned something about, um, something similar to what I was going to say is, um, uh, I saw a TikTok a while ago, and um, there was a native Chinese person saying that it, they were fine with like people wearing their uh, culture outfits. They're, it was totally fine and everything. But there was a big uh, group of other people, Chinese Asian Americans, who kind of had a different uh, different um, 
thoughts and approach just because I mean it's 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 way different from someone from the origin country um, and the people coming in with it compared to um, in America um, and a lot of the kind of comments um, from Asian Americans were saying that they don't it's they don't go through the same endeavors of the you know the Asian hate crimes the the misappropriation and like uh, media and everything too so I just want to add that thing like when when it comes to um, ex American uh, American slash whatever their origin country is and a uh, geography pretty much. Thank you for that. That is so true. In our research, we've actually seen sort of the the differences and and responses to different celebrities wearing different things. So we we will analyze that further. But thank you so much for bringing that to the forefront because that is so important to remember as well. And here we go. That's exactly what we're going to talk about. Exactly. So here we have three different images of three different moments. So we have 1983, we have Audrey Hepburn in Japan, like as an actor, as a celebrity kind of in Japan, in her way, appreciating the culture, just like Freddie Mercury is on his Japan tour, like has chosen intentionally what to wear as his way of like being part of the country that he's in and the history that he's in. When Lady Gaga attended a press conference for her launch of her new album, Joanne, in Tokyo, the recording company actually gave her this surprise gift, um, which is a silk kimono from the Japanese contemporary kimono designer, which is Jotaro Saito. And we're putting his link in the chat for anyone who wants a custom uh, kimono. But the pastel color pink kimono was created just for Lady Gaga. And it's the same color as her album. And she cried, apparently. So uh, that's the little moment to Lady Gaga. Well, and, and just going up back off of what Kobe said, right? So here we're looking at feedback on Katy Perry's, Katy Perry's kimono performance. So she performed in a kimono, in a kimono, excuse me, in 2013 at the AMAs and received huge backlash from the American audience. However, Japanese community that was local to Japan didn't feel the same way. And so we have um, a clip of just um, a review. I don't know if we're going to be able to, to share that at this point or not, but um, we're dropping that into the chat, just a example of um, that video. So I think we're just going to move on from here. Uh, in the interest of time. In the interest of time. But that there's a clip in the chat if you guys want to watch that. So now we're going to, um, there's the clip. <laughs> Katy Perry be wild in the <laughs> room her whole stage performance and everybody like not just her backup dancers like she had to she really had to do a lot it's just like wow <laughs> um well, we might be experiencing a little technical difficulty as we try to for the next slide click yeah. on the slide um, oh here we go and this disaster disaster i mean seriously this is just highlighting a disaster here's here's more stuff um, focusing on this, this, uh, um, quote right here at the top, this is pulled from the same article that we shared earlier. So, but context is key. While a Japanese person living in Japan may think nothing of a non-Japanese person incorporating a kimono into their look, a person in a setting where they're a minority or marginalized may feel differently. So exactly going back to what Kobe was saying and just really, really, really emphasizing that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're going from Kim K's cultural appropriation that happens just, uh, it's just awful to, um, well, I mean, she's really like an example for, for that big fast fashion. So she's like, she starts this new brand. She names it, whatever she wants. People are like, Oh, this isn't okay. So she, she changes her name, but this is like a large corporation essentially like creating fashion. And then, I mean, I don't even know how she came to the name kimono. I wonder if it's because her name is Kim. I'm not like all into the details of it. If anyone knows the story of like how she came up with her name, I would love to learn, but um, yeah. And then we have like cheaply made Halloween costumes and they're all like sexy. And then Ariel, read the title that it says above that. Um, Smithy's Women Vodka Geisha Costume. <laughs> A vodka geisha. That's my favorite part of this whole catastrophe, a vodka geisha. Like, okay. Um, yeah, I think we're ready for the Amazon friendly. Exactly, Jerry. Exactly. It'll be there fast. It'll be cheap. 
you can get really drunk in it and then throw it away the next day. And then don't even remember what you did. It could happen. Um, so we want to follow this same model, right? With orins, origins, influence, appropriation, and disgrace. So um, this is another like a very old and like common um, moment in American uh, in American culture and contemporary culture where folks are using this like eagle feather, which isn't actually even as common as, as we all make it out to be. But um, we um, connected with tribal trade and they spoke with numerous First Nations elders and um, they explained in their video that like eagle feathers, they use eagle feathers because eagle, eagles fly the highest. And it's the idea is that eagles are the messenger to the creator. And so, Eagle feathers are actually extremely honorable and they need to be earned for a brave or a respectful act. And each individual feather that anyone might be wearing on their regalia would need to be gifted and, and earned. So just having like all these feathers, it doesn't come from nothing. Like when someone has like, usually it's a chief, um, that kind of a headdress, then it's because of the experiences that that person has gone through. Um, it's also used for healing and purifying spaces um, and folks wear them in their hair or they raise their hands up high into the sky to show their appreciation and to show that they feel they've been blessed and that they're in honoring the creator. So um, it's just another moment to kind of see that we have this idea of origin and then what happens to it, Ariel? Well, before I even start, I see that someone's raised their hand. Mm, great. So let's do it. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm speaking from an indigenous perspective here. So mm -hmm. first, really, really important that we highlight this. And I really appreciate it because this is the bane of my existence come this time of the year, every single year. Um, so I do want to emphasize that war bonnets are only worn by very specific people. And literally it's like maybe like 3% out of all of us that get to wear war bonnets. So um, seeing those is not only super offensive, but it's frustrating because to be able to get to the stature where you get to wear a, a war bonnet, it's like the highest degree of respect that, that your community can have for you. Um, so to see that misappropriated is even more frustrating than it is disappointing. Um, another issue here is that these costumes often sexualize women and indigenous women, particularly um, in North America, that being the US and in Canada, parts of the Amazon as well, are being traded, are being murdered at alarming rates, at rapidly growing rates. And um, we're going missing at really, really crazy rates. So the sexualization of our women is something that like we, we really, really take very seriously. Mm -hmm. And it's violence that's constantly perpetuated against our people in ways that, you know, normally you wouldn't really be able to tell, but the exotification of different cultures, whether it's like the, what like whether it's, um, in the Japanese culture, you often see that in Asian cultures as well. You often see that in Latin American cultures. It's just the exotification and the fetishization of like, of POCs in general is, is a huge, huge crime. And I think that's something that we would have to talk about if we're discussing the appropriation of, of certain cultures um, throughout different costumes. So that, and um, I guess that's really all I'll mention for now because I don't want to go on a huge tangent, but thank you. Can you say your name? Aurealis. Aurealis. Thank you. Oh, you really pronounced that well. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on to the next slide. So we want to talk about culture versus costume. We've kind of um, looked at this from a bunch of different perspectives. And so this is really just a summary of, of where we've been. Um, we have Heidi Klum as the Hindu deity. We have Julian Hoff as Crazy Eyes. Um, we have Paris Hilton. I don't even 
I don't even know what I, what that is. I can't even describe that. And then Chris Brown, like called it a terrorist outfit, like a terrorist, like he's the Taliban essentially. And then his friend, like all the way in the back, I don't know if y'all can see that. Like, I don't know if TMS tech support can zoom in, but like, he's got a crew to kind of support the outfit. Like they're all telling some kind of story together. So just even that idea, it's like one person goes in the complete wrong direction and then has all these yes people and followers who are just going to keep going with it. Like, um, but yeah, I mean, this is like seeing how culture and costume kind of can conflate in this very unfortunate way. Damn it, dang way. And here we have um, just more Halloween costumes that are terrible. Um, and we, we were trying to point out, or we were trying to find on TMS as, as TMS team, like an example of a costume, even here, that is representing a person versus a culture. Because that's what we were trying to look at for all these costumes, because you can see all of these costumes are kind of generalizing a culture. We thought maybe only one was trying to represent a specific person, but then we thought maybe not. So just Halloween costumes being bad, essentially. Yeah, what happens, like if we go to the next slide, what happens if a character is a, also a culture and then that's also a costume? Um, and this quote here says, to treat a character like Batman or Superman as a Halloween costume is one thing but to treat an entire ethnicity as a costume is something else. It suggests that people conflate the actual broad diversity of a culture with caricatures and characters. Um, and this quote is from a CNN article about the Ohio University um, students campaign in which they started a, contain a campaign called We're a Culture, Not a Costume in response to on-campus faculty all joining and gathering up to throw a Halloween costume in which the entire faculty dressed as a mariachi band. Blackface isn't a culture at all. Yes, Jerry. So here we're going to start talking about cultural figures. So I'm glad that we brought up blackface because we, as we were coming across like culturally appropriated costumes, we came across stuff like an Obama mask, which is technically a celebrity, but where does the line get drawn between cultural appropriation and representing a character or a celebrity? And I know Lily wants to talk more about the picture on the left. Yeah, so I found this in research. And um, the reason I chose it is because the high school was like throwing a Halloween party and this black kid comes to school dressed as Jesus. And he got sent to the principal's office because the school called it offensive. And they said that, you know, it's offensive to be dressing up um, and using religious regalia. But the mother was like very vocal and questioning about like, well, if this was a white man that had come to school, would y'all still be offended? Like, are you offended because you're Christians and you're offended of like the, the holy and the sanctity of the outfit? Or are you offended because you're just offended by black Jesus? Um, and if that's the case, then obviously, I mean, regardless, they didn't think that they had done anything wrong, but um, it's really important to take all of this apart because people will just get really upset and then you can't get clear of like, well, what is it exactly about this moment that you don't agree with? And who is this person? Like you said, Brittany, again, coming back to the power, like who has power here and like, what is an institution against a single person? Like, what does that look like? Um, so yeah. And I mean, Obama's like, like we, we talked about this and we we're like, yeah, every president has a mask that you can buy, but Obama's like the first and only black president. So yeah, he's a president like all the other ones, but he's not like all the other ones in that sense. So does it matter who's underneath that mask? Like if it's a mask and your face is covered, does it matter who's underneath there? Yes or no? Yes. Salsa shark. I see that mixed president. Yep. So this kind of brings us to the question that we had earlier, and we are really, really totally welcoming community members to weigh in here. So how do we approach the topic of cultural appropriation with young ones, right? That was something that we talked about with school pride, but specifically thinking about is Halloween an opportunity to teach kids to express themselves without societal constraints, or are we really 
trying to enforce, like, let's not culturally appropriate. And we were specifically looking at little girls wearing um, Halloween costumes of their favorite princess. So we have a few links that we're sharing. So the first one was just talking about parents that are divided on whether it's okay to let their kids dress as Moana for Halloween. Okay, next slide. <laughs> so, I mean, what do you think? Like, how do we talk about this thing with, how do we talk about cultural appropriation with kids? Like, what do you, how do you define it with kids? Um, and as we go through these examples, like really this is just kind of leads us into the open discussion. Um, I think we can go through, yeah. So here we go. We see it like dressing children up as Disney princesses. Um, the costume, like folks, obviously folks warned to not do this. And again, we see the over-sexualization too. Like we, we talked about that. Um, how do you break it to a kid that they can't dress as their favorite character? Exactly. Well, and like what, if you're showing folks representation in order to aspire to something, you know, or respect something that isn't necessarily the same as them, but then they try to emulate it and it's not okay, then what, like, what's the message essentially? Um, and then <laughs> to me, the biggest irony is this last one. If we go to the last slide, if we go to the Princess Elsa slide, um, so the blogger of this article who was using these examples, she took aim at, you know, Disney's frozen character, Elsa. She says like, because Elsa is a white princess and they, there's so many white princesses, her character sends the message that you have to be a certain way to be beautiful, which like from a colorist and a white supremacist perspective, absolutely. But like, if we're saying white kids can't dress up as princesses of color, but then they also shouldn't really dress up as white princesses because there's a lot of representation already. Like, what does that leave them with in the sense? Or like, where, where does that go? Obviously they could skip the princess thing altogether, but Disney has folks' minds like so wrapped up that I don't foresee that happening. So it just kind of leaves this place of like, well, where do you go from here? And I think that's where we're going to leave it. <laughs> Aditi, please. I will say that this is a tough one. I have an eight-year-old um, daughter, and just like every other girl growing up, even when she was four or five, Six, uh, she was obsessed with all things Disney and she wanted uh, you know she wanted to dress like her favorite princess and I've we've never gotten um, that far just maybe because the costumes are insanely expensive if you want to get them to I'm a last minute shopper anyway and so it's like they are expensive and for one reason or another that hasn't ended up happening but at the same time when we watch movies like Moana and Aladdin to a certain extent, I've taken the opportunity to make that an experience of creating awareness and of, you know, educating her about the cultures that these princesses were technically supposed to be from, although they, well, Aladdin was the 90s, so it was all entirely inappropriate now and so inaccurate um, but to the extent that it is relatable to to a child of that age it we've taken this opportunity to you know learn more about that particular part of the world or that culture or that country so i i don't have a solution or an answer to this but i do struggle with this almost every year now she's moving into like more non-princess stuff which is great so just um, but it is a tough one. Well, Aditi, this is the perfect opportunity to introduce you. Um, Philip, I see you, and then we'll have you right after um, I introduce Aditi, our, our superstar of the night. Thank you so much for um, what you've shared so far. 
Um, we are going to highlight Aditi for a minute and move away from our screen share as we move into our fashion show part of the evening. Um, Aditi Bhatia is the founder of Passport to Fashion, which, um, and she's also the marketing manager for Columbus Fashion Council and for Fashion Week Columbus. Um, so all the folks, the Columbus peeps out here show some love. Um, she owns a digital marketing company called The Spice Age and an events company called Events Amplified. Um, all the links will be dropped in the chat. But um, yeah, you also founded a full week of um, South Asian style and fashion. Um, Aditi is amazing and she's a leader in the community and she has a lot to say about this. So we're really excited to partner with Passports to Fashion, who, in my opinion, is just like the mix space just for fashion. Um, so it's like actually a dream kind of sisterhood that we've been able to create here. And so, yeah, just everyone welcome Aditi as we um, learn more about her and her work and um, continue this conversation and actually get to um, the other side of the evening. Thank you so much. I was smiling from ear to ear. That's such a such an incredible introduction. And I'm so grateful to be here. I've already learned so much in the past um, hour from all of you and from the conversations in the chat. And I could not be happier. I'd never imagined a Tuesday evening being this interesting um, in, in, in normal in my normal week. So I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, that introduction um, covered a lot of things, but what I'd like to focus on today is the platform that I founded four years ago called Passport to Fashion. Um, and the story, if, if I can share that really quickly, um, is that I'm of South Asian origin. I grew up in India and moved here when I was 19. And, um, you know, I, I love my culture and I want to proudly celebrate my heritage. But there are parts of my culture that are are not so great and and I want to do something about that and I'm referring to negative body image and colorism where Indian culture struggles with a lot of that even today and um, you know I, I've struggled with uh, being a person of different weights and different shapes and sizes and I've seen firsthand how that uh, how that can be and um, and and with passport to fashion what we set out to do was to create the notion that fashion can be for everyone and that you don't have to be a certain way, a certain shape, a certain size or a certain skin color to be fashionable. Anybody and everybody can be fashionable. We are changing the way runways look at our fashion shows. We are not putting a stereotypical runway model size, your zeros, your twos and your fours. We're not putting just those sizes on the runway. We have all ages, um, all sizes and all ethnicities represented, not only on our runways, but within our teams and um, the everybody that is part of the platform. So this is an incredible collaboration. And like I was telling um, the TMS team yesterday, this was meant to be. Uh, we just got done with our fourth annual runway show, which is part of Fashion Week Columbus. And the feedback and the support that we've received has been incredible. We are based in Columbus, Ohio, um, and I do work at Ohio State. So that thing that we talked about, about Ohio State, not super proud of that, but um, it, it's just incredible to be here. And I'm looking forward to getting into the, the fashion show and, and talking to everyone more. Yes, thank you so much for introducing yourself. Um, I am gonna let, um, we have some folks who are raising their hands, so let's let's do that. Um, you know who you are, take yourself off mute, and let's go from there. Philip? Oh, there I am, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just wanted to add, because I, I can speak personally from the Disney cosplay experience as well, um, as someone of Polynesian descent, I'm just gonna drop into you the chat my Maui cosplay that I did from Moana since we were talking about Moana earlier. And uh, with um, specifically with tattoos in um, Polynesian uh, oceanic cultures, you know, tattoos are earned. Uh, they're often a representative of experiences or milestones in life. 
Um, and uh, I was brought out by Disney to Anaheim as part of their uh, Disney Expo a couple of years ago. And just the response has been really amazing. But um, the reason why I created an entirely different bodysuit, which is um, which I hand illustrated all of the all of the tattoos on there. Um, uh, very detailed to the original design since I personally have an entire different set of body tattoos on my personal um, self. Um, and so I just wanted to contribute that um, now Disney musical theatricals there, they've launched Moana Jr., which is the um, uh, kind of like on stage version of Moana. They specifically put in the casting and production notes that Maui portrayed in their school productions or in onstage productions cannot have any tattoos. And so they made very specific um, uh, guidelines you know, for their production notes. So I just wanted to add that piece, um, how Disney Theatricals is approaching that. Mm, thank you so much. Just giving a moment for folks to digest if anyone wants to jump in. Aditi, I'm going to hand it to you to kind of start our virtual fashion show moment um, and host us through this experience. Um, so, yeah, I feel like there should be lights flashing. And <laughs> <everything. laughs> Thank you. And, uh, you know, I'm excited about this because doing a fashion show in this way uh, is so much in the theme of what we talk about at Passport to Fashion, where we're talk, you know, we are not defining or sticking to a definition of what a model is, who a designer could be. It's about real people showcasing their individuality. That's who our designers are. Some of our, our um, models or the folks that walk on our runways are also about expressing their creativity and individuality. And, and I think this is the exact setting um, for that to happen as well. So, uh, you know, this is a, a, um, a space where we can all come as we are and be who we are and share what we may be dressed in today and and how that you know why that is sacred to you and what about that specific outfit or your particular um item of clothing uh, what it says to you and and if everyone's okay with it i'll start and and sort of get the the ball rolling so i don't know um if you all can see so i'm dressed in a traditional where i can walk back i've got a bit of a mask um but i'm wearing a traditional indian outfit called a salvar kameez and what it is is a long shirt and uh pants that you cannot see but it has this vibrant scarf the colors of this um outfit are very special to me because they signify um womanhood and everything that uh, makes um, the, the female, the, the strength, um, woman power is what I should say, not womanhood. But this is also the month um, in India, this is the time where we're celebrating um, goddesses. And, and so this is like an embodiment of that female power. Um, this is also my idea of rebellion, because the, the color red and gold is very significant of a, um, of a married woman. I am divorced. And so back in the day, like many, many, many years ago, this would have not been okay for somebody without a husband to dress in these colors. But it, in, today, it's, it's not as relevant. Maybe in some parts of India, there might still be these restrictions, but not um, not where uh, I grew up or not where I, not where my family, li family lives, but traditionally this is an act of rebellion is to dress in the jewelry and dress in the colors. Um, this would not have been okay 50 years ago or 60 years ago. And so that's, that's me and I'm happy to take questions and then we can go on to, to whoever wants to share next. Thank you so much. Can you put the name of your um, clothing in the chat so I can see it spelt? Yes. Thank you. Does anyone else want to respond or does anyone have any questions? Hi, Peter, welcome. Thanks. I have a 
question. Oh, sorry. Did I cut someone off? No. Um, your earrings. I was going to ask you, I'm a huge earring fan and I feel like it can be a really big part of someone's self-expression. So I was just curious, like if there's any, yeah, I wanted to see them a little closer. <laughs> oh my gosh, they look gorgeous. And Thank I don't you. know if there's a story behind them or like where you got them, but they're just, I just wanted to mention that they're beautiful. And Thank yeah. you. Thank you. They're a very traditional Indian shape called a junka, and I'll put that in the chat as well. And junkas can come in all different shapes and sizes. I, I'm crazy about collecting them. So I have some really large ones, and then I have these like okay ones that aren't too crazy. But this is a new, um, or not new, it's new to me because I don't visit uh, as often, but it is this new line of, um, or new type of jewelry known as temple jewelry. And this brings me uh, to what I was going to say about cultural appropriation earlier, but we'll get into that later. This is called temple jewelry and it actually has etched inside of it is the silhouette of a goddess. And, and that is the significance of the month um, that, that is going on right now where we're celebrating goddesses and everything I said about, you know, feminine power and, and all of that, like this is, really really special to me to be able to own this piece of jewelry my cousin uh, makes them so she has a, a workshop of artisans and and she has a whole setup where she makes them and so I try to buy everything from her um, and so she I have a necklace that matches which is gorgeous but I left that out and it's it, this is my favorite pair so thank you for letting me share that Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, go for it, Christian. I figured out how to unmute myself. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing. And I, I love that you talked about how, you know, in one part, you have this honoring a tradition, and this other part, this like rebellious part. And I think about how culture by its very definition, is not a static thing culture is constantly evolving. It's constantly changing. And, um, and I think, you know, right now we, there's always been an, an interchange of, of cultures, you know, and, and so much more so now with the internet. And uh, we find ourselves, I think at a really interesting time. And I think you're, you are, are showing us a good example of that, of like, in one part, we want to honor traditions that are important to us that mean something to us and you have this aspect of you know colonialism and imperialism that has really stripped a lot of people of their cultures of their traditions and then on this other hand you have this strong association or, or realization that many of our traditional cultures come from like they're really based in like a lot of misogyny a lot of just old very rigid ways of thinking that have often themselves been a part of oppression and that's like all of our cultures all around the world have this history especially misogyny especially with this idea of you know oppressing women or making women into a certain certain image so it's just you you really i think that you're you're capturing some of the power that can come in culture especially when we 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 take culture for ourselves and we take ownership of our culture where I do think that there is a way to find that, that middle space where we can honor the good parts of tradition that make us feel a part of something bigger and longer and connected to our ancestors while also moving that needle along and into a, just a more inclusive, a more like a less oppressive way of living. So cool. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, you know, it, it, I want to add that something um, that relates to, to what was being said earlier about awareness and education, because there, there can be so much damage that can be done from not knowing and not being completely aware of what it is that is causing the issue, right? Or what is it that is inappropriate? Now, for example, if one of you wanted to borrow my scarf, I would be totally okay with it because as somebody that has grown up in India and spent time here, and I want to compare and contrast this with the kimono discussion that we were having earlier, 
um, th there are there are parts of the Indian culture that are very open to sharing and very open to this exchange and very open to somebody coming in and embracing that. And in like, as you know, as opposed to the Heidi Klum disaster, right? That's not okay. But if you wanted, you know, to borrow my earrings or borrow my scarf or say, hey, can you order me one when you, you know, order or go back to India or, or something like that? Yes, that's totally okay because that is giving you, or that that's making me um, tell you more about my culture and tell you more about, you know, what does this mean? What does this red and gold weave mean? Like what? And I'm getting that that opportunity to tell one more person about what it is that that is special to me and why it's special to me. So cultural appropriation is a very um, is a very loaded topic, but it's important to sort of break apart what is it that is inappropriate and why is it inappropriate instead of being or making it like being intimidated by it, I guess. So thank you for, for saying what you said. And I could go on about this stuff. I mean, I, I wake up every day and, and think of, you know, think of these things, but let's, um, let's see if we have somebody else on here that would like to share uh, something about a piece that they're wearing or an outfit that they're wearing and why and how that's special to them. Okay. So I'm, this is what I'm wearing. Um, the funny part about this is this feels very traditional to me, but I have no idea where it came from. My, my best friend from college in New York knew that I was searching for traditional feeling pieces. I'm Mexican. Um, and she so one day just said, I found this, I thrifted this, here you go. And it's, I, I feel like it's so um, important to me because I've been to, I, I frequent Mexico, I have family in Mexico. Um, and there are shops that sell shirts like this. And so even though I can't claim where it came from, it feels just like very, very, very powerful to me. I actually wore this um, when my grandmother passed and we had a celebration of life for her. I wore this um, and it's just, it holds a lot of um, feeling for me. And when I was in New York as a student, I actually would dress this up and dress it down, which I found to be a very fun thing. So I would go to class wearing this and jeans kind of as a challenge to myself because I found it really hard to wear this out in public just as something that was casual because it held a lot of significance to me, but also because in a way, like I was embarrassed because no one really wears stuff like this out. So um, that's why I chose to pick this today because um, it feels very traditional. And yet um, I would make it a challenge to myself to wear this with jeans or something just to dress it down, to still be able to represent my culture in a day-to-day -day class situation, but um, not be embarrassed about it. And then for fun, I added glitter because I thought it'd be a fun little twist to it. And I'm wearing the traditional like red lipstick that I feel like is maybe a staple of <laughs> um, girls that wear stuff like this. So this is this is what I chose to wear today. To wear today, this is my sacred. This is my sacred seam. Um, I was gonna try to put flowers in my hair, but I couldn't find flowers to clip in. Um, my stepmom actually dresses very traditionally sometimes, and she has those huge flowers that she puts and clips into her hair. Um, but I couldn't find any. But this is this is the outfit. Attention on the sleeves. This is all embroidered. It's, it's quite gorgeous. Um, I don't know what it was doing at a thrift store, but I'm so glad that I have it now in my, in my little, my little, yeah. And there's like beautiful stuff on the sleeves. So that's, this is my sacred team. It's, it's gorgeous. Thank you for sharing that. And what I will add there is that, you know, a piece can become special to us. Um, even if it, it even if it doesn't have a cultural significance or an origin that, you know, is rooted in tradition. And you and I are the perfect examples of that. And I'm so glad that, that you shared your story with us. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share. Christian, you're next if you want to. Yeah, I totally um, want to share something that I haven't pulled out of my closet in forever. Uh, on the lines of like appropriation and some of the like, I love that cu cultural approximation too. That's such a good word. Um, 
But before I settled in 2016 in Minneapolis and started to um, go on my own kind of journey of like facing my own like internal racism and just stuff that had to go out of my life and biases and stuff. Before that, I was traveling the United States uh, with the Renaissance Fair and talk about like in one part, this like expression and like queer culture. And it started off in the 60s as like very alternate, you know, counterculture, but talk about like massive ambiguous appropriation, <laughs> like mm -hmm. every which way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I when I um, worked there, I always um, I dressed in like what I would call just like very generic arabesque, you know, like generic kind of Middle Eastern type clothing that I'd find at thrift stores or things like that. But the very um, start of my like my very first show I doing, I, I my very first piece of garb was um, this vest here and it was a gift and, you know, definitely kind of just and ambiguous, you know, Asian kind of type vest. It was a gift from a friend. I think they got it from a thrift store. Who knows kind of where it was. But this was like my most treasured piece of clothing for so many years. And um, on the lines of, of culture and what really brought me to this conversation today was Culture is always a weird one for me because I come, I'm very American. I'm very white, Caucasian, whitewashed American. But like, if I, I'm very, I'm very estranged from a lot of my family. We've been here for, you know, since the 1800s. But I'm very recently learning that on all aspects, paternal and maternal of my family, they all came to America from some kind of conflict in another country over the years. And uh, what I feel the most, what I've always felt the most kinship for is my Syrian and Lebanese uh, heritage. And it has always resonated with me. It's always been something that's special and important to me, but it's, I'm totally like my grandmother was senile and she was the last one to like speak Arabic. Like I'm totally severed from that part of my heritage. And, you know, as I've learned, like my family, all different types of family coming from conflict, I think they really chose the route of assimilation and just assimilated to the culture at the time. Um, this time from New York, they were all like New York City kind of just assimilated into that culture. And um, there was also, I think, a lot of trauma from coming from conflict, you know, from you know, I just, it, that generational trauma really followed us. And we kind of just now are just the kind of everyday white American kind of culture. And it's, I am someone who is, who like really um, tries to have a lot of respect for traditional cultures, but there is definitely always also this like pang, this like little bit of hurt of like, I have no idea what my traditional cultures are, you know? And it makes me think too of just us as a human species we all had an indigenous origin somewhere, you know, and we all as one species come from this, like 99% of our species what, uh, of our history was hunter gatherer, you know? And it's, again, it goes back to like imperialism and colonialism, just kind of like doing this number on the whole world. <laughs> and so, you know, I look now, like I said, I haven't taken this out of my closet. I don't really have any of the other stuff that was just definitely very, a lot of the stuff I wore was like mountain people, like Nepalese, not Nepalese kind of stuff. And it's just, you know, just an, even, even Middle Eastern where I could kind of say I have some of that heritage, it still feels inappropriate to me because I'm so separate from it. But I just wanted to like put on, like give some of my experience and just some of that, like, it sucks. It sucks that I am not connected to my ancestors and I'm not connected to my history. And it sucks that that's the case for so many people and so many people have had to assimilate or mask themselves or just hide parts of themselves most of the time just for safety. And like that, that sucks. <laughs> but hey, thanks for letting me share. This is really cool tonight. Glad I came. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank yes, you. The snaps. Yes, Sean. 
Yeah, um, that was so lovely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I definitely have a lot of similar kinds of experiences. I mean, I'm uh, first generation. My parents are immigrants, um, but even the loss of language, any any step where you are removed, that severance, it, it really cuts deep. Um, so I brought something that I guess was my attempt a part of my ongoing attempt to reconnect. Um, and this is a part of a ceremonial, well, I'll say a formal garb. Uh, you could argue that it is ceremonial, but it's an Indonesian um, little headpiece that I got when I went to study uh, mask making uh, and performance in Bali, Indonesia. And for those of you that don't know, um, Indonesia is an archipelago of islands um, in Southeast Asia, but Bali specifically is an island that retained much of its Hindu heritage. So you can say that Bali is part of the Indian diaspora. So um, my, my father is from India, my mother is from China. And when I went to Bali, um, there was this kind of, it, it, it felt like some kind of uncanny reconnection with a, a, a distantly related part of myself. Um, and the people there like saw me and they were like, oh, are you from here? And I'm like, no. Um, but then the more I talked with them, they were like, oh, well, culturally, we are a mixture of those two things. So you belong here, too. And that was deeply, deeply affecting to me. Um, and on top of that, um, as, I, as I do, I often go to um, different parts of the world for um, theater projects um, to um, learn about different cultures um, and, or create art for local audiences. Um, uh, and oftentimes when I go on these trips, I'm one of the few people of color who are there. And while there is a risk of this cultural tourism, I try to you know, go with groups that really value cultural exchange and um, appreciation. Um, and as we were in Bali, um, I was <laughs> afforded the strange privilege of actually being allowed inside one of the Hindu temples because um, my family is from um, that background, even though I never really grew up as a practicing Hindu, it was still interestingly welcomed. Um, and I'm still, you know, wrapping my mind around what it means to be Hindu or what it means to understand Hinduism. Um, and part of that is about the representation of the culture and um, and its images, and when is it sacred, and when is it fashion or abstract design? Like I, um, I think our clothes should value uh, should represent our values more than anything. Um, and for me, a big part of that is not just saying I'm going to decolonize, but saying I I want to wear garments that have patterns that are not just like plaid stripes like sometimes plaid is really nice but you know when you go to the store like to say that you can only choose from things that are eurocentric and western like i i'm not interested in that and of course plaid also has a very specific origin in in um uh, scotland or, or ireland and um and even like the exact colors and stripes mean something there. So at the end of the day, um, I think it's like you said, Christian, like we are all coming from somewhere that was indigenous and things move and they change. Um, and that any cultural ideas are fluid. Um, just, I mean, like this, this hat and just the concept of what Balinese Hinduism is. It's part of, like I said, part of the diaspora. Um, so, yeah, um, just saying that, okay, I can choose to wear, you know, 
a textile in this way, or like, I want shoes that have paisley, even though the shoes are not Indian, there's no point at the end, you know? Um, and even, even one of my, my jackets, it's like Indian fashion, but it's not religious. So I, I think it's really important to consider what that is and find ways to celebrate each other in the right contexts. Um, honestly, when it comes to appropriation, I'm like, if you, if you do something that is inaccurate or cartoonish for me, I I'm personally moving away from being offended and more to just being like, wow, you kind of look dumb or I'm going to laugh at you. <laughs> um, which maybe gives me a position of power. I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. So <laughs> anyways, um, thanks for, thanks for doing this, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that, Shana. It's such an interesting perspective that you have on, on so many different things. And I love that part at the end you said about, you know, and, and it's, you're laughing at somebody that has done something inappropriate, but at the same time, if there's an opportunity to tell them what they did wrong, then now you you positively affected change. And that's what it really is all about. And we want to learn about other cultures and we want others to learn about our culture. And, and I, I know I've said this already, but I feel like when we, terms like this have been used in the media so much because of what celebrities do and whatnot, that it's become a scary thing. And, you know, there's, there's a lot that, that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to make this world a smaller place in terms of everybody becoming aware of other cultures and other um, parts of the world. And, and I think we can play a little part in that. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Who, um, who calls next, like Lily says? You know, I'd be up for sharing, I suppose. Go ahead. Huh? I'm Peter, and um, and and Sean. I just actually wanted to just comment before I shared. I really liked your last comment there. I, I think that was really. Uh, I want to learn from that. <laughs> I I just it's funny because as this I, I've been really appreciating this conversation, and as it's been going on, it just reminded me of, um, you know, one of my friends. I remember a couple of years ago, uh, telling me that she was going to be a Chinese person for Halloween. And I was like, hey, that's not right. <laughs> you know, like, that's just not right. And, uh, and uh, also, I, I live in Santa Cruz. And down the way from here is Pacific Grove, which is a, um, it's a community that used to have a Chinese community. And they chased them all out because of racism and burned the you know, place down. And my friend who lives there said, hey, you got to come by to our Chinese New Year party. And I said, but there's no Chinese people there. And she said, oh, well, you know, we uh, we dress up like the animal of the year and uh, we have, you know, we have this big like dance party. And I'm like, you know, that's not the way Chinese New Year is traditionally celebrated. And she's like, oh, yeah, but there's no Chinese people. So they they kicked all the people out, but then kept the party. And I was just like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, it's so messed up. So sorry, I, I tend to get like all outraged about it, but I really like I liked your attitude of just looking at it like in a positive way so like kind of in a humorous way so I think I'm going to try to adopt that um, the thing that I'm just going to share actually this is inspiring me because I need to finish getting it fixed to the so it fits it's it's like a modern version of a traditional Chinese jacket uh, I don't know if you can see very clearly but you know it's just like got a Chinese collar and I actually spent a lot of money to get this and I haven't had like a Chinese jacket since I was a kid. So my, my parents are immigrants from Taiwan and I used to have this awesome one that was all like puffy and it had like, it was blue with, you know, like the Chinese symbols in it. It was all puffy and it was super nice. And, um, and I was looking for something like that. Actually, I was, I, you know, have spent time both in Taiwan and China and never found anything that I really liked. And so I finally, I was like, well, you know, this is kind of like a little bit of a sellout jacket in the sense that it's not like totally like Chinese, but, but I, I was like, you know, I want to have some Chinese clothing. So um, I spent, yeah, kind of a lot of energy to get this. And then 
And then the other thing that recently has been my, um, my new favorite t-shirt that uh, has come from, uh, I think, you know, particularly recently with all the anti-Asian American stuff, it's just been really noticeable to me of like how, you know, the, the underreporting of like Asian American violence, like I've had like multiple incidents where, uh, you know, I, I thought I was going to die or like my, my life, you know, my, I was, my safety was threatened. I was only once that I thought I was going to die, but other times where my safety was threatened and I never reported it to anybody. I never even worried about it. And, and I just realized, you know, like as, uh, I just feel like it would be great for, for Asian Americans just to be louder in the U S. And so that's been on my mind, but, um, but I've been really appreciating. Yeah. This, this conversation is really neat. It's because clothing has been on my mind. I I've noticed, I, I think um, I've definitely growing up. I, I grew up in a place that were very few Asian Americans, actually very few people of color. And it was a uh, very much of a, yeah, like, assimilation. And I recently, some of my friends pointed out to me, uh, I'm like a dance performer. So I wear lots of crazy clothes when I, when I'm dancing, but my personal clothing is always like dark and neutral and unassuming and out of the way. And so it was just, it's been very interesting to think about that. So it's, it's been on my mind. So I really appreciate this and I, and I love all the sharing. So thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'd like to share next. So I really love everyone's stories. It actually gave me a little bit more courage to kind of say my own. I was a little bit kind of nervous um, and kind of like uh, with Ariel, actually, like I honestly don't know much history and stuff about my clothing. I'm, I'm half, Mexican, half Mexican and half Chinese, both uh, immigrant parents. So um, but with that, even even if I'm half Chinese, I uh, my dad, you know, uh, grew up from like a country where they had a genocide so it was more of survival more of just like assimilation so I didn't really learn much about it um, about my Chinese culture at least um, but I made an effort to buy one last year um, I live near Chinatown I live in Chinatown actually in LA so it's actually really easily accessible um, to Peter's comment actually I always thought it was interesting why not more young adults wear these um, or like teenagers to young adults because you often at least in America um or at least in California, where I grew, grew up in, um, you'll mo more than often just see kids wear it or, uh, or adults wear it, um, never in between pretty much. Um, but I mean, if you live like near a Chinatown, like I do, there'll, there'll be much more options, but way harder to kind of find out elsewhere. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely uh, wanted to kind of share this and feel more comfortable in this too. Um, I, wear it, I wore it last Lunar New Year and I plan to wear it again for the upcoming Lunar New Year. Um, but it's just kind of an interesting story to hear. Um, I asked some of my friends' parents and my parents, like, what is it called? Because I actually had to do some quick work research before, right before this meeting, actually, because I wanted to, like, if I were to share, I was like, I want to be able to kind of share this. Because, um, like, I asked some some of my parents' friends, and they're Chinese, too, and they're like, I don't know, we just say shirt in Chinese, like, tenshan, like, just shirt, like, you know, there's not really, like, a proper word. But, I mean, there is. I'm, um, I think a lot of people, depending on the person you ask, may not know the proper name. And because like some have like a collar, um, the other one, the Lee show didn't have one, but then still had like similar like designs and everything too. So, and then you'll see the ones we've been talking about with a lot of the female celebrities with the Qi Pao, like the, it's like kind of like a more slimmer version and everything. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, it's really interesting. Um, I look forward to kind of like getting more comfortable in this attire um, and just learning more about it and like, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I will add really quickly that um, I, my daughter's experiences growing up have shaped a lot of my understanding of what it means to identify with one's culture and, and what it means to be somebody that was born here outside of their, um, you know, outside of the, the country that their parents came from. And, and there are things that she has said that have made me think, and some of that has gone into the creation of Passport to Fashion. And one of the things that she would, would do and say when she was little was she didn't like to be seen in her traditional Indian clothing. And what she would want is she would want to hide in the car or just not walk to like wherever we needed to go. And she's like, I don't want other people to see me in this. And 
and and to me it it it's such an such a uh, such an opposite of what i do i'm proudly flaunting like any chance i get you know indian items and what not and for her it was like so i don't think this is okay i don't want other people to see me in this and and it was to me that was one of the motivations behind uh you know like bringing indian culture um mainstream to mainstream fashion in columbus but then also giving other cultures that opportunity to be part of a mainstream fashion week and a fashion show so um i i just thought that was relevant to to share but let's see um who wants to who wants to share next i'll go i'll share yeah um so this is my sacred seams outfit it's a kind of like can't i guess i have to go further back can't really see it it's like a little bit of a dress it goes to like mid thigh um and my aunt carol gave it to me for my birthday um so my dad's family is from new orleans they're they've been in the lower ninth ward and all around new orleans for a long time they're very black and um creole and you know the kind of mix that happens in in new orleans over generations and my mother is german and irish and um i was born in the us but i was my dad's a, was an air force sergeant and so we were transferred to germany and i grew up there and learned the language but um my family is actually on both sides quite connected to africa um both like the white side of my family and the black side of my family like travel to africa um, my aunt is um marrying a man in africa so she's getting ready to move there and um i i travel there um when i can um and i hope to be able to kind of build almost like a tricontinental life in some way i'm not quite sure what that would look like but um so anyway this is this is my sacred seam and what i what i find interesting about the journey of the seams like i've been really interested in kind of like the the trading and the the journey of seams so this was created in senegal and it was shipped over to new orleans because my aunt's best friend has a stand at the african market in new orleans so she sells clothing and attire to the uh, to the fellow african community who live in New Orleans because it's their only way to access um like foods and clothing and um yeah cultural pieces that they can't really get from home or that are too expensive to import on their own um so but it's it's the print the print is kind of it's a print of traditional kente cloth and i think this is like something that we're seeing a lot now like kente cloth has become more common to see but kente cloth in and of itself is like a very specific way that it's created and it has its own history and so it's not actual kente cloth which is usually not even worn as clothing it's like the print of kente cloth on a piece of clothing um and so that's just interesting to me as i think about clothing and like where it's been i said that earlier like the lives of our clothing before it kind of lands in our closet but i do want to just share that like the origins of kente cloth date back to the 12th century in africa um specifically actually to ghana and the ashanti people um and the kente cloth received its name from the term kenten which actually means basket because of the clothes woven design and kenten cloth is made by hand and the design of it so the the, the it's made by hand so whoever's making the cloth has the design in their head while they're making it so it's real artistry and visual design and, vi and like visionary work that's happening because there's no other way for the design to come out other than when you have it in your head and then you switch colors and and you're really weaving it so um each kenten pattern is unique because you can't recreate it digitally um and black actually like the color the color black um is the most significant um incorporated color and it represents spiritual strength and maturity um and red symbolizes blood and the the political passion and the strength that is connected to the transatlantic slave trade and the history um on the continent and then blue stands for peace love and harmony which i don't have blue on this cloth um i don't know what that means if i'm i don't have the color i don't know and then yellow represents wealth and and royalty so 
that is, that's my moment. That's my, this is my sacred scene. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I'm learning so much um, and, and it's just indescribable. Like I have all these emotions that are, that are filling my heart and I, I'm so grateful. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yes, Philip. Uh, so I mentioned a little bit about this uh, dress in the back. I'm just gonna drop into uh, the chat a little bit more, uh, the actual project behind it. Uh, and so I work as a costume maker, costume designer, uh, and specifically, I like to integrate um, specifically the Filipino culture in pretty surprising ways. And I had decided to kind of appropriate C.S. Lewis and the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Narnia. Because when we think of Narnia, we think of little white girls, and little white children running around, going into a closet and ending up in, in Narnia. Um, however, I wanted to kind of create a prequel to that. There's an established book um, by C.S. Lewis. It's a very short passage about Queen Jadis and her sister. And so there really hasn't been like a, a, a pop culture media representation of it. So I did a whole film project, but recentered the visual narrative to two Filipina sisters uh, wearing traditional Filipina dresses. Uh, and I chose to represent um, you know, in this particular um, uh, retelling, reimagining about um, two different areas of the Philippines. Uh, one is the Ifugao tribe, which is representative of the red, black, and white pattern and color that you would see on the dress. And then also in Mindanao, which is more of the indigenous tribal um, groups there as well with the basket weaving, but taking the um, silhouette of the classic Spanish terno dress uh, and turning them into rival sisters. So if you're unfamiliar with the Narnia series from C.S. Lewis, it is about um, kind of the takeover of power and where power is centered. And in this particular prequel um, project, um, we decided to depict them as you know, two sisters. And the two actresses in my project um, are also mixed. They are half Filipina and half um, um, white. Um, one is from Louisville, Kentucky. The other one's um, uh, white origin is from Spain. So it was a really cool project infusing the uh, Filipino, uh, traditional Filipino dress and gown with specific call outs to um, uh, certain areas of the Philippines. There's over 7,000 islands in the Philippines, like Indonesia is an archipelago, and there's over um, 50 different languages and dialects within. Uh, the collective archipelago itself. But um, yeah, if you take a look at the blog, there's just a, a little bit more of a background on, on the choices of that. So I wanted to share that piece as well and how I'm kind of re-envisioning um, you know, Philippine culture and style and fashion into um, uh, kind of products that have existed for years. That's, that's amazing. And I just clicked on the link that you shared. And this is this is wonderful work. Thank you for, for doing what you do and for sharing that with us to, to educate everyone about your culture and and uh, the, the different parts of it. This is like I said, this is this is wonderful. Thank you. And I, do, and, I want, and I do want to add that the two actresses, models, they learned Filipino martial arts specifically for this <laughs> for this project. So they they're practicing uh, Eskrima, Filipino stick fighting for real. So they had to train with a, a fight choreographer, but it was all part of that willingness to dive deeper into their own culture that they have felt a little bit dissimilated from. Uh, so they want to feel more connection with their own culture. And it was a cool project for all of us to kind of explore our culture in a fun and creative way. You said 7,000 islands, right? Yes, uh, 7,000 islands and then 7,001 on low tide. Raymond was like, did you say 7,000? Like, yes. They, uh, people live on all 7,000 islands? I mean, to be honest, I haven't checked. Um, but I'm sure there's still like this, uh, uh, that's, that's what the joke was, was that 
it's 7001 on low tide because a random island would pop up um but there would be um you know a, a lot of them are inhabited and there are there are others that are just kind of outposts like a, a united states has a presence there oh. with its own naval base and um uh, and unfortunately right now uh philippines is is kind of in dispute with china over who owns what lands so there's an ongoing yeah you know, as you were talking about colonization and who owns what that's still ongoing Wow. <laughs> I'm screaming. <laughs> Sarah, I saw you took yourself off mm -hmm. um, or put yourself rather on camera. Would you like to share with us? Sure. I guess if, if anyone else, if no one else is going to share, I can step in. <laughs> um, I guess first, I just want to thank everyone. This has been really wonderful and I've really enjoyed and just appreciated everyone's stories and perspectives. It's, it's always so inspiring to hear like the diversity that we have in all of, you know, in this world, it's really inspiring. So thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm um, mixed Vietnamese. My mother's Vietnamese Chinese. Um, she was a, a refugee from Vietnam and my father's um, German, English, Jewish, American, grew up in unceded Lenape land here in Philly. <laughs> um, and so um, I'm wearing today a Vietnamese Ao Yai, um, which is a traditional Vietnamese dress for, um, there's a version for women and men, um, but it's sort of become a symbol of um, kind of women of femininity. Um, traditionally, back in the day, it was um, very loosely worn with very simple cotton fabrics. Um, and then I think, you know, the long time of French colonization in Vietnam, um, you always think of French fashion. At some point, they turned it into kind of the fitted look that it is today, and it sort of continues to evolve. Um, so here, I don't know if you can all see. Um, it's Ao Yai, which means um, Ao is short and Yai is long. So I don't know if I can step back enough. You can see how, I mean, um, you can kind of see it's a shirt, a long shirt and with long pants. And I don't know if you remember, um, I guess uh, Michelle Obama visited Vietnam when um, during the, Obama's presidency and she actually had one designed for her and it was gorgeous and it was gifted to her. Um, so um, yeah, there hasn't been a whole lot of, um, you know, appropriation of it, Of thankfully. I think there's little bits here and there that you see, um, but it's still pretty traditional. And it's interesting because every so often you see the style change and it's fun because my mother and I have a dressmaker in Vietnam who have all our measurements because it's very fitted. And so um, I have aunts there that will go and pick out fabrics for us and then take it to the dressmaker. So when we have a relative that goes back and forth, then um, my mother will go to the market or my aunts, my aunties, and they'll pick out the fabrics and then they'll take it to the dressmaker. And then whoever is coming back to visit or, you know, vice versa, will bring a bunch of new dresses for us. We get a little spoiled. <laughs> and because they're all, the measurements is very, like everything is very, precise to your arms and like every part of your body and they're meant to be very fitted. So I don't know if you can see, um, very fitted, <laughs> um, which is lovely because you know, you're always gonna have a dress that fits you. <laughs> um, and it's pants, so they're super comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> which I love. I just wore, actually, this is the one I just wore to a friend's wedding on Saturday. <laughs> and so, and they come like, now they make them with like boat collars and get them short sleeves. And um, traditionally, I think if you look up Vietnamese fashion um, and different styles of clothing um, in the North, they would wear ones that have long, like um, split panels Um and so, but this is right for the South. And right now, I think I was, my mother and I always look up to see what the fashion is. And right now in Vietnam, it's, um, they've become shorter because right now mine, you can't see it, but it goes all the way down to the floor. Um, so you have to wear heels. Um, but now the style is right below the knee and with a skirt, which my mother's like, 
no way. <laughs> That's too modern for her. <laughs> She's like traditional, traditional. So um, it's amazing to see. I know I forget who mentioned how dynamic culture is and how it's always changing. And it's always fun to see, um, you know, the different styles and how they've evolved, um, but yet still maintained in its traditional beauty. Um, and women wear red ones for weddings. Um, now there's more of a westernization so women are starting to have ones made that are white instead but then you have these headdresses that are really beautiful that go with it and um yeah and you'll see if you go to vietnam you'll see that a lot of um, uniforms like women that go to banks they still wear them um high school girls wear white ones to school um, so, uh, you know, that's always something, you'll know who the high school girls are because they'll come out, you know, with the, riding their bikes with the wind fluttering their eye oh, yeah, and it's very beautiful. So, um, yeah, so that's a little bit, I mean, there's a lot of history that I don't know. Now I'm like, oh, I need to read more. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just a beautiful part. And I think, um, you know, I was relating to some things that people were saying earlier, just I think um, because I look, um, I'm very um, white presenting compared to a lot of my family. Um, and like maybe my sister looks so much more Vietnamese than I do. And so I get mistaken actually more for like Latina and things like that. And so it was always really hard for me growing up um, wearing one of these because people would be like, what's, you know, like, why is the white girl wearing a Vietnamese dress, you know, <laughs> um, like if, especially if I wasn't with my mother. And so it took me a really long time to um, own it. And still, when I go to Vietnamese weddings, like I just went to my cousin's wedding in California, um, in Orange County, where it's all Vietnamese people. Um, and I was one of the very few people wearing one of these. And all, most of my Vietnamese, all my Vietnamese cousins, everyone, like everyone was wearing, you know, Western clothes. Um, and that's so normal now. And, you know, you get all those looks like, oh. Like she's wearing an ayai, like what? <laughs> and so I still get like a lot of anxiety depending on where I go and how it's taken because of, you know, I am so white presenting and I know it's still part of my own journey of um, my own kind of identity and how I'm, how to accept and own that. Um, so, yeah, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that in terms of, you know, we're all in such a multicultural world and have so many different identities these days and how to not have imposter syndrome and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, so this is just something that I've learned to love so much. And um, thank you for letting me share it with you. <laughs> thank all of you too. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. That's beautiful. Wow. My heart is so full. Um, I really appreciate everyone of you sharing and being here and being open to receiving other people's stories and um, holding holding the space. Um, Aditi, I'm going to let you keep guiding us, actually. We're going to move on into our um, whiteboard section, where essentially we can, as a group, just connect and like share everything that we're learning and that we want to take out of the space. And we're going to post the, the instructions in the chat. But um, this is actually a great time of the meetup because um, everyone can annotate. So it's like a very collaborative moment where everyone just like puts what they are, you know, looking forward to. Um, I like to call it pledges or commitments. Like what's something that you commit to um, based on our conversation today that you are, you know, moving taking with you into your life. So folks have said, I want to read more. I want to learn more about a certain aspect, or um, I have certain questions that I want to ask, or I'm not going to shy away from calling folks out or starting a certain kind of conversation. So all of that has space here. Um, and just in general, as you kind of take a minute to reflect what's been said today, um, questions that you're grappling with, words that you've learned, concepts that have inspired you, all of that can land here on this work, this, um, this whiteboard. I, I do have to apologize. I have to leave the daughter I kept talking about. She needs me. It's going to be close to, to bedtime for her. And so I just really want to say a big, big thank you to all of you for sharing and for making um, this is a safe space where I could share so comfortably. It was really, really nice meeting you all. 
I hope to stay in touch. My um, handles will drop in the chat and I know they'll be on the blog and stuff um, later, but my heart is full and I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. I love already what's coming up here. What are you, it's what are you adding, contributing rather than taking? Context is key. Cultural allocation. Ooh, whoever's writing here, because there was another word. It was like, there was two, I feel like that Philip added to our space today, two really big words, cultural allocation. And there was another one, Philip. Is that you that's writing that? Otherwise, maybe you can help out whoever's writing it who might still be trying to look for the other word. I think it was cultural approximation was other one, right? <laughs> awesome. Intention is everything. Correct pro pronunciation. Yes, approximation. Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's definitely a big one. Mm. Thank you, Damien. Oh, folks, put your um, uh, socials in the chat. Um, anything that you want to share, if there's projects that you're working on, if there's opportunities that you want folks to know about, if there's um, anyone in the space particular that you wanted to connect with more, like this is the time to do that. We would love to be able to follow all of you on Instagram and continue this conversation. And um, Arielle, actually, I'm going to give it to you because you are our queen when it comes to all the helpful stuff. Okay. Um, yes. As Lily said, please be dropping your stuff in the chat. Um, we have a meetup 2.0 that is going to come up. And actually, I think um, we are talking to Philip for the meetup 2.0. So that will be on Instagram live. That's going to happen not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after that. So we are so excited. Philip is here. We're going to be talking more to Philip later. Um, we're just going to go a little bit deeper into these kind of conversations and we will be on Instagram live. So that'll be at the mix space on Instagram live. Just make sure that you're following our Instagram page. Cause we're going to post all of that stuff on our page as more posts. Um, we have a meetup coming up in November on the 16th and we have two amazing speakers actually already selected, already lined up. We're talking all about, um, indigenous from indigenous culture what does that look like cultural survival um sustainability and just really delving into what our perspectives from indigenous community members that we can highlight so we have two amazing community members that are going to be sharing with us so make sure to watch for that also you could find more about that on our website soon i don't know if we've put that up quite yet but just make sure that you are staying up to date with that and um as always if you want to collaborate with us feel free to contact us at contact at the mixspace.com super easy to remember um and yeah that's pretty much all of the housekeeping stuff as i said please make sure to drop your socials i see people are so thank you for that um and i don't think i've missed anything i have i have well one thing is that on instagram we just posted it there is um a form that we love for people to fill out i'm posting like the blank one right now so what you do is you go on instagram and you screenshot the little form that's in our stories and then you fill it out and then you tag the mix space so that at the end everyone's like shared learning can be amplified. Um, so especially after we just got done with the whiteboard and all your learning is still fresh, like it just makes sense to um, fill out the form and then like let other people know what you've shared so we can keep um, the story of this meetup alive and we can continue the conversation. Um, and um, this says Facebook page, but I do want to let you know it's a Facebook group. It's like we have, oh yeah, great Facebook group to continue the conversation. Okay, we said all that already. Perfect. Contact at the mix space. Perfect. Everyone's socials. Perfect. Okay. Um, oh yeah. And the feedback form. It's also a really 
like big deal for us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, what, what we can do to continue to make you feel as great as hopefully you felt today and your ideas for making it better. Cause it's always shifting. 